Elite weightlifters and bodybuilders are bigger than ever before, largely thanks to steroids and growth hormones. But where did this trend begin and how has it evolved? You find out today. A muscular image. When most people think of bodybuilders, if they think of them at all, images of towering muscle-bound men such as Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno come to mind. However, when the latest Mr. Olympia bodybuilding competitions take place, it is a virtual certainty that the winner of the sport's premier event won't be more than six feet in height. The wits of top competitors such as Kai Green and Branch Warren are another matter entirely, a testament to the rigorous training and chemical supplementation regimens that have made the sport both more physically challenging and less accessible than ever. For many, Schwarzenegger represents the alpha and omega of bodybuilding. He was the sport's first genuine celebrity, its first crossover star, and still remains the tallest champion at 6'2 in the history of the Olympia. Along with his mentor and sponsor Joe Weider, Schwarzenegger deserves much of the credit for popularizing the use of resistance exercise for strictly aesthetic purposes. The era over which he presided, which stretched from the late 1960s until his retirement in 1980, coincided with the rapid growth of the American fitness industry. When he chose to focus on his budding film career, bodybuilding as a concept retained its cultural purchase. Everyone from Hollywood action heroes to then-President Reagan was pumping up during the 1980s, even as the sport itself gradually receded from view due to its inability to produce another figure of Arnold's stature. Putting Schwarzenegger to shame What it has produced, however, is a series of champions whose physiques put Schwarzenegger's to shame. Texas native Ronnie Coleman, an eight-time Mr. Olympia, who is arguably the greatest bodybuilder of all time, had a listed height of 5'10", but frequently took the competition stage at 295 pounds. Jay Cutler, Coleman's immediate successor as Mr. Olympia, competed at an equally massive 280 pounds. Even at his peak, Schwarzenegger never exceeded a competition weight of 235 pounds. The physiques of modern bodybuilders were quite literally unattainable during the early days of the sport. Competitive bodybuilding's origins can be traced to the 1930s when the Amateur Athletic Union hosted its Mr. America pageants in conjunction with weightlifting competitions. The popularity of these exhibitions soon exceeded that of the strength events that typically preceded them, and regardless of whether they were held first or last, they invariably attracted larger crowds than the athletic components of the AAU meets. Joe Weider, a fitness magazine publisher whose offerings included such titles as Demigods and the Young Physique, recognized the economic potential of these spectacles and began staging his own bodybuilding-only pageants. First held in 1965, the Mr. Olympia competition was intended to serve as the world championship for Weider's International Federation of Bodybuilding Organization. Back in History From the outset, Mr. Olympia participants benefited from one of the great discoveries of the 1950s, anabolic steroids. After physician John Ziegler developed the oral steroid Dianabol, a host of other androgenic drugs entered the market. Following the success of 1950s bodybuilding icon Steve Reeves, who boasted a better-defined physique than his predecessors, judging standards in the sport evolved in the direction of vascular, striated muscle, muscle that was much easier to develop and maintain with such pharmaceutical assistance. Larry Scott, who won the first Mr. Olympia at a competition weight of 205 pounds, was one of the first athletes to combine scientific bodybuilding training with extraordinary proportions, including a tape-measured set of 20-inch biceps. Subsequent winners Sergio Oliva and Arnold Schwarzenegger pushed the envelope still further, cultivating physiques unrivaled by even the finest examples of Greek statuary. When 240-pound Lee Haney emerged as an unbeatable competitor in the early 1980s, it appeared that human development could go no further. With his victory in the 1992 Mr. Olympia, English bodybuilder Dorian Yates changed all of that. Though only 5'9", Yates competed at a lean 270 pounds through the combination of a maniacal training program with precise steroid usage that was stacked with growth hormone. GH proved to be a missing link in the chain that allowed athletes to reach unprecedented lean weights, a trend that culminated with Ronnie Coleman winning the Olympia at 297 pounds only a few years after competing and losing at a mere 245. Observers have hailed Phil Heath's recent victories at the Olympia as a return to normalcy, but Heath competes at a heavier weight than Haney, Schwarzenegger, or Oliva ever did. Unavoidable Mass Monsters The so-called mass monsters that dominate contemporary bodybuilding are both unavoidable and anonymous. Unavoidable because their images are beamed out at impressionable young men from magazines available at supermarket checkout counters around the country, and anonymous because only a handful of diehards seem to know the intimate details of these athletes' training programs. 
The information found in these magazines, many of which are still published by the company Joe Weider founded, is utterly misleading. The silence about the use of anabolic steroids and growth hormone is as conspicuous as the kayfabe code that once surrounded professional wrestling and protected that sport's most intimate secrets. Even Grantland published an interesting commentary on the life and times of Phil Heath that glossed over the endemic drug use in the sport, noting that since every serious competitor uses steroids, it all comes down to training and a beauteous physical symphony of posing. When Heath, Kai Green, and Branch Warren take the stage in Las Vegas, their bodies will glisten with the sheen of superhuman perfection. Their fat-free mass indexes will be impossible for well-meaning amateurs like ourselves to replicate. Much will be said about the workouts the competitors perform, seven hours a day in the gym, thousands of repetitions of various exercises, with no mention of the chemicals that make these workouts possible. Such a discussion of the benefits and drawbacks of steroid supplementation would be useful, given that steroids are banned in most professional sports and have been treated as controlled substances in the U.S. since the passage of the Anabolic Steroids Control Act of 1990. Personal Accounts We reached out to our bodybuilding buddy Mark to get his take on the matter. Steroids are a tremendous business, Mark says. There are dealers everywhere, and bodybuilders often sell them in health clubs. If you start training with anyone who has crazy muscles and say that you want to try out some steroids, he'll send you to a friend who will sell some to you. If you're an average guy in the gym, you'll get charged double, but once you make some connections, you can stock up on them. Mark, who has been in the fitness training business since 1987, says he often bought a one- or two-month supply. Rather than continuously using steroids, users cycle the drugs, using for a set time, stopping, and then starting again. Some users also combine steroids with other types of drugs through stacking. Anabolic steroids are psychologically addicting, which makes them as difficult to quit as cocaine, Mark says. In return for the feel-good nature and physical effects of the drugs, Mark experienced hair loss, liver dysfunction, dehydration, acne, and psychotic aggression commonly called roid rage. For his use, Mark eventually was arrested and sentenced to a stint in a narcotic rehab center rather than the state penitentiary. Since anabolic steroids became illegal to sell or possess without a prescription in 1990, users of steroids and other controlled substances, such as cocaine or heroin, are treated the same under federal law. Possession of illegally obtained steroids carries a maximum penalty of one year in prison and a $1,000 fine for a first felony drug offense. If the user is caught a second time, the fine and the maximum period of imprisonment doubles. Traffickers are charged a maximum of five years in prison along with a $250,000 fine. 20 years ago, before steroids became illegal, bodybuilders and athletes used them for strength, power, and size, says John Hansen, a natural bodybuilding champion in Chicago. At that time, the gyms weren't as well equipped. Each gym was independently owned, and the clubs appealed to bodybuilders. If you went to some of these hardcore gyms, it wasn't unusual to see people shooting up in locker rooms, he says. The owners of these clubs were probably also using steroids. Today, much of the fitness world has changed. Many fitness centers are run by management teams, charge expensive fees, and target a broader audience, pushing steroid use underground. However, these illegal substances are still finding their way into health clubs and gyms. A constant evolution process Bodybuilding has continued to evolve. Its leading athletes are shorter, squatter, and more powerfully built than ever before. But in so many ways, the sport remains an afterthought. The media might note the name of this year's Mr. Olympia, and a few well-meaning boys might ingest the protein powders he endorses, but that will be the extent of it. For an activity in which the sacrifices are so great, where even a first-time competitor such as academic-turned-bodybuilder Samuel Fussell must give his entire life over to its practice, the competitors deserve far better. More transparency about its processes and history would be a welcome development. That's all for this video, folks. We'll see you another time.